All right, here we go. We're in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18 is our text today. Now, if you remember, Hebrews is written to a church that's been persecuted, that has suffered for the gospel. They are hurting. They are struggling in their faith, and they are wondering, are they going to continue to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the author sees If something doesn't happen, the trajectory that they're on, they will begin to drift from the faith. And so the book of Hebrews is written to strengthen the church. And so I just want to ask you as we begin this morning, have you ever had that moment of crisis in your faith? Have you ever felt that all that you believe just might not be true? Are you there right now? Are you wondering, is the gospel true? Are you wrestling with your faith in Jesus Christ today? You see, this book, the book of Hebrews, is about strengthening the faith of the church in the midst of a storm. It's about coming to a church that has wrestled with its faith, that's been kicked, that's been beaten, that's been persecuted, and it comes alongside to strengthen them that they would continue trusting in Jesus Christ. And so today, what we're going to do is, is see that the author it just brings us into the gospel, and he wants to look at certain truths of the gospel and how these truths are meant to strengthen you and I, are meant to equip us so that we can stand firm in this faith. And I got to let you know, if we get this message, if we understand this message in Hebrews chapter 2, it will increase our joy. We will experience comfort and hope in Christ. It will strengthen us in our faith. I want you to know this is an incredible text. And so here's the main point. The gospel saves us from our sins and strengthens us to stand firm against every temptation. Do you know that? It saves and strengthen. So here we go. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to stand. We're going to read chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, the end of the chapter. It says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let me pray. Oh, Father, your word is good. Your word is good, it is perfect, it is holy. And Lord, I pray that your Spirit works in your word as we walk through this text, that our faith would be strengthened, that we would with greater clarity understand the gospel, and with greater conviction we would believe that your Son Jesus is the one true Savior, Son of God who came in the flesh to die the death we deserve, to suffer in our place, that He would provide forgiveness from our sins, and that then He would be our faithful and merciful High Priest, strengthening us each and every day. Oh, Father, I pray we know this. I pray that we know this. And if there's anyone who's listening to this message that is struggling in their faith, that is wrestling with just, do they believe In this gospel, I pray you would use this word and equip and comfort and strengthen them. In your name, Jesus, amen. Um, First thing, first thing I want us to see, the gospel is about the Son of God taking on flesh and becoming one of us. Look at verse 14. There we read, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of these things. Look at verse 17. It says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. 
And if you go back to chapter 9, which we preached a couple of weeks ago, it says, but we see him, this is referring to Jesus, who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels. That's referring to Jesus coming in the flesh. All of these verses are about Jesus coming in the flesh. We cannot miss this. The gospel that we preach every week, the gospel that's contained in this Bible, the 66 books of God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word, the gospel that Paul says has the power to save both Jew and Gentile. It is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming in the flesh and becoming like you and I. Like We got to see this. Christianity is different from every other religion. Do you know that? Because in Christianity, Christianity is about God becoming one of us because we have no opportunity or because we have no chance of becoming like him. And so he becomes like us so he would save us and sanctify us so we'd be made like him. Do you get that? And so all of chapter 2 has been explaining why Jesus has come in the flesh. And so to give just a quick recap, if you weren't, if you haven't listened to the messages uh, through chapter 2, this is your quick recap, but by all means not exhaustive. Uh, first thing we saw was that man is create was created by God to have a crown of glory and rule creation. That was the purpose of God creating man. But then, and we saw that in verses 6 through 8, because the author quotes Psalm 8 there, which speaks of man being created for the purpose of ruling and sharing in the very glory of God. But what we know is all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, Adam sinned. Adam rejected the rule and authority of God. He rebelled against God. And when Adam sinned, he plunged all of humanity into sin as well. Um, because It's because we come from Adam that you and I, we are born as sinful. And because we are sinful, we have no opportunity to ever obtain the crown of glory. We have no hope in our works, in our effort to ever receive the crown of glory. And if you remember, we use this word called federal headship. And federal headship, if you remember, is basically about representation. And so Adam, the first man, represented all of humanity. And thus, when he sinned, because we all come from him and he is our representative, we then all become sinners as well. And so what, what we need then is a new federal head. What we need is a new humanity. We need a, a redeemed humanity. But the problem is we all come from Adam. And so how is it that we're, all, that we're going to get out of Adam if we all come from Adam? That's why Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. That's why he came in this miraculous way, that he would come as the Son of God, not from Adam, that he, he would save humanity. And so Jesus comes in the flesh. And in verse 9, we read that then he suffers and he dies. And because of that, he received the crown of glory. So get this. The crown of glory that we were supposed to get but because of sin, we forfeited. Jesus now comes. And through his death and resurrection, he receives the crown of glory. And in verse 10, it says that he saves us so that we would then become sons of glory. And throughout the rest of chapter, or and through verses 11 through 13, it talks about how he sanctifies us. I mean, he makes us like himself. And he adopts us into the family that he would call us brothers and sisters and we would become the very children of God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that is contained in this Bible. And so, and it all comes to us by grace. We have no, no ability to achieve, 
to earn, to merit the crown of glory, to merit salvation, to merit any kindness or favor from God at all. But God, because of his great grace, sent Jesus that he would come and he would die in our place so we could be saved and sanctified, adopted into the family of God, that we would share in the very glory of God for all of eternity. That's what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. Now, here's the question. How exactly does Jesus coming in the flesh save us from our sin problem? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so we're going to see three more reasons why Jesus came in the flesh. Number one, Jesus frees us from the kingdom of Satan. The Bible is about kingdoms. And there's really two kingdoms that we see in God's word. There's God's kingdom, and then there's Satan's kingdom, which also can be termed as the world's kingdom. And uh, what we understand is that because we are sinful, we're born into the kingdom of Satan, meaning we naturally rebel against God's world, God's word. We re rebel against his rule. We disobey him. And so Jesus comes in the flesh on a rescue mission to bring us out of the kingdom of Satan, which is destined for destruction, and bring us into the kingdom of God. And that's what we see. Uh, or how does he do that? And we see that here in verse 14. First, Jesus defeated Satan. That's the first thing he does. In verse 14, we read, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. When Jesus died on the cross, he destroyed the devil. Now, what does that word destroy mean? It does not mean obliterate or annihilate. Rather, what the word means is to cause someone or something to lose power. And at the cross, Jesus made the devil powerless. Uh, think of it like this. Imagine you walk into someone's yard and you're making your way up to their front door and all of a sudden out of the bushes comes this gigantic dog. And he's barking and he's growling and he's running at you and he begins to leap in the air and you know he's going to bite you. You know he's going to get you. But then, all of a sudden, the chain that's attached to the dog's collar goes tight and it snaps the dog back down to the ground before he's able to get to you. And that chain has rendered that dog powerless. It has bound him so that he cannot get to you. The bite of the dog has become ineffective. That is what Jesus has done to Satan at the cross. The cross of Jesus is the un unmovable stake that holds the chain in which Satan has been bound. Now then, the question then begs, what does it mean that Satan is bound? Well, in Revelation 12, we read um, about what it means where, G where, where the devil was defeated. And I just want to read from Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. It's such a helpful passage in understanding how Jesus defeated and made the devil powerless. Here we go. It says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come for the accusers. This is Satan. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. So hear this. Satan is your accuser. And he says, you deserve death. He says, you have rebelled against God. You deserve the very wrath of God. He does not advocate for you, but he advocates against you. At every moment, he's recalling your mistakes, your failures, and your sins. He's reminding God you're guilty, guilty, 
guilty. He's pointing out your unrighteousness at every moment of the day. That's what he does. That's what Satan does. But notice what the text says. It says, our accuser has been thrown down. He's been conquered. He's been defeated. But how? By the blood of the Lamb. You see, at the cross, Jesus died the death that we deserve. And on that cross, he suffered the wrath that you and I should have received. That's why Jesus came in the flesh. That's why it was so important for him to come. Because as God, he cannot suffer. He cannot die, but he comes in the flesh. That as a man, he would suffer. As a man, he would die in our place. And hear this. If you've trusted in Jesus, Satan can no longer accuse you as guilty before God because Jesus has justified you by his blood. He paid the price of your sin on the cross so that by grace you would be saved and declared righteous. And so no longer does Satan, the accuser, have any power, but it's been stripped from him. Because when he yells out, guilty, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and he says, justified. Do you know that? If you are in Christ, you are justified. You are declared righteous. But that's not all that Jesus has done. Notice, secondly, Jesus delivers us from death. He defeats the devil. He delivers us from death. Now, death looms uh, upon every person. It It always hangs in the background, reminding us that there is an end that is coming. And Satan, Satan loves to use the power of death as a means of paralyzing us, as a means of bringing fear into our very lives. And when that happens, it can cause us to live a safe life in which we never risk anything. We will prioritize our well-being, our health, and our safety at all times because we are fearful of death. And let me ask you, are you fearful of death? Are you fearful of what lies beyond the curtain of death? I want you to hear this. If you've trusted in Jesus, then you do not need to fear death. Why? Because At the cross, Jesus defeated death. Jesus' death is the death of death. I think think John Owen even titled his sermon, The Death of Death, when he preached this. What that means is that he conquered death, so we no longer need to fear it. You see, the Bible teaches that death comes as a result of sin. And so therefore, if at the cross, Jesus dealt with our sin problem, paying the price for our sins, that we could be justified and declared righteous, then he also dealt with the problem of death. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, we read that Jesus Christ is also a high priest. And we'll unpack this more in a moment. But I just want you to notice, and it says he made a propitious sacrifice. Now that word propitiation, if you're, <clears throat> if you're a part of our church at Timberline, then we use that word a lot because it is extremely important. There is no gospel without the word propitiation. See, the word means wrath absorber. And, and think of like if you, if you have a bucket of water and you put a sponge <clears throat> in that water, that sponge will absorb all that water in the bucket. And so, just as as a sponge will absorb the water, so Jesus is our wrath absorber. He goes to the cross where He stands in your place and my place and He absorbs all the wrath of God that you and I deserve because we are sinners and He absorbs it in Himself at that death so that when you and I believe in Him, we'd be forgiven and that we would no longer need to fear death. The penalty of death has been paid, or the penalty of our sin has been paid. And no longer is death need, do we need to fear death. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, I think, that death has lost its sting. It cannot hurt us. Do you know that? 
Do you know that no, death is no longer something you need to fear? Do you know that death has lost its sting? And he's like, you might say, that, but why then do we still die? Well, we will still die physically. Because um, until Christ returns, we will not experience the fullness of the kingdom coming where we receive new bodies that will never die. But hear this, we will never experience the second death. The second death is what scripture talks about, eternal torment. It's, it's hell. It's reserved for those who have rejected God. It's reserved for those who persist in their unrighteousness and will not believe in Jesus Christ. And for them, because they have rejected the work of Jesus, and thus they will then go to the second death where they must experience that wrath of God. And they will experience it for all of eternity. It will be a never-ending dying a never-ending pain, a never-ending suffering. But hear this. If you've trusted in Jesus, Jesus paid that price for you, for me. Which is why we don't need to fear death anymore. Because Revelation says Jesus has risen from the grave and He now sits at the right hand of God and He holds in His right hand the keys of death and Hades. He has full authority over them. Now think about, think about how glorious that truth is to this church in Hebrews. Here it is. They're suffering in their faith. They've been persecuted by the world and they're wondering, can we continue? And the first thing the author says is, remember, you're justified. Jesus went and he defeated the devil. He can no longer accuse you. You are righteous. Secondly, he says, and don't worry about death. It's lost its sting. It's been defeated. I want you to think about what power do our persecutors have when they can no longer threaten us with death, with the killing of our bodies. I mean, think about it. For 2,000 years, Christians have gone to unreached peoples, proclaiming the gospel where many of them have been killed and martyred. In fact, right now, there are Christians in countries like Korea and China and India and many other places where they're risking their lives every day. They know they could be arrested and killed for the faith. And yet they persist. Why? Because death has been defeated. They know that the sting of death has been removed. And Paul says, Paul says this in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now why? Why is death gain? How is it that we as believers can say death is gain? Well, Paul answers that in Philippians 1 verse 23, just a couple of verses later. He says this, he says, I am hard-pressed between the two, meaning between these two decisions. He says, my de desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So Paul's arrested. He's in jail. And he says, look, I just, I just want to depart, depart from this world. I want to be with Jesus. But then he says, but I know for your well-being I must stay so that I might continue to preach the gospel and strengthen and equip you. But listen. For the Christian, we can say we long to depart from this world because when we do, we will be welcomed into the very arms of Christ. You see, for the Christian, beyond the curtain of death is the warm embrace of our Savior, of our King, of Jesus Christ, the one who has died for us. Hear this. <clears throat> We can risk everything for the gospel because in Jesus, we've been given everything. We've been made sons of glory. We've been adopted in the family of God. He promises us that He sanctifies us and He will make us like Him and He will share with us His crown and His glory for all of eternity. What can the world do to us, Christian? If they persecute us, we praise God and we say we, we were counted worthy to suffer for His name. If they kill us, we praise God because we count the glory of God as greater 
than our very lives here on earth. If they beat us, we praise God. Because we know that our body is simply a jar of clay and one day we will be given new immortal bodies that will last forever in the presence of God. Here this, Jesus defeated the devil and he defeated death at the cross. He has freed us from our sin by being our perfect sacrifice. But, but what we're going to see is that Jesus is not just our sacrifice. He's also our high priest. And as he makes this transition, notice in verse 16 that he says, For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Meaning, Christ comes from the line of Abraham. And he's saying, if you've trusted in Christ, this is whom God helps. This is who this is true for. So if you are a believer, then you come from the line of Abraham. And you are righteous in the eyes of God, and death has been defeated. But Jesus is not just our sacrifice, he's also our priest. And we read this in verse 17, where it talks about Jesus being our faithful and merciful high priest. Now, first thing I want you to see is if, if Jesus is our high priest, then he must be human, which is why we read, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and high priest. You see, a priest is someone who represents others. And if you're going to represent others, then you must be like them. So Jesus comes in the flesh, not only so he'd be our sacrifice, but that he'd be our priest. And then it says that he's merciful and faithful. And I just want to look at those two for just a moment. How is it that Jesus is our merciful high priest? Well, the word mercy refers to God's goodness given to those who are in misery. Because, because all of humanity is sinful, we're in a state of misery. You see, God doesn't sit back in his chair and just watch all the things that are happening on earth and say, well, good luck to them. But no, he sees us in our misery and he says, I will save them. I will help them. And so he sends his son. But Jesus doesn't come to earth kicking and screaming. He comes willingly and full of joy, clothing himself in humanity so that he'd be like one of us. So that he'd be able to save us from our sins. That's how Jesus is our merciful high priest. He comes as the priest who will offer the perfect sacrifice himself that we would be saved. Next, we see that he is faithful. And when we talk about Jesus' Jesus' faithfulness as a high priest, there's at least two things that we can talk about. Number one, he is faithful in that he did everything the Father asked. He was obedient in every single way. One author said this. He said, Our hell he made his, that his heaven might be ours. Jesus obeyed God perfectly that he would then endure our suffering so that we could experience the life that he gives us. Secondly, though, it doesn't just mean that he is faithful in his obedience, but that he faithfully represents us to the Father. You see, Jesus right now is faithfully at the right hand of the Father, and he's declaring, you and I are innocent. Remember, Satan wants to accuse you and I. He wants to say, no, no, they're sinful. No, no, they're not worthy. He wants to say, you're guilty, guilty, guilty. And yet Jesus at the right hand of the Father says, no, no, justified, declared righteous, made a child of God, a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Do you know that truth? Do you know that Jesus is your faithful high priest? always interceding for you and for me. In the Gospel of John, we read this. This is what Jesus says in, in John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And then he says this in verse 39 and 40. He says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. 
That is Jesus' commitment to you and I. He says, I am the faithful high priest. I know whom the sacrifice has been made for. And all that the Father has, co- has given me, I will raise. And so hear this. If you've trusted in Jesus, then death has been defeated. The devil has been defeated. You are declared holy and righteous. And Jesus forever stands at the right hand of the Father declaring justified. Do you know that? He's our faithful and merciful high priest. So you might say at this moment, okay, okay, so I get this. Jesus is the guarantee of my salvation. Jesus promises that if I die, I will rise with him. He promises us that we will live forever and that we have everlasting life. But someone might say, what about right now? How does all that Jesus has done affect me right now? I mean, think about this church. They're suffering. They're persecuted. Some of the members are in jail. They've lost their possessions. Some have been beaten. And they're sitting there going, how do we continue? How do we go another day? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever wrestled with that type of agony and that type of pain in your soul? This is where I want us to see the beauty of verse 18, where Jesus helps us right now in our suffering. So far, we've seen Jesus saves us from our sins, and now we're going to see, and he strengthens us against every temptation. But before we look at verse 18, I want us to just look at some of the false gospels that are widely, if I can say it, widely proclaimed right now in our culture. And I just want to say, how do they approach pain and suffering and death? And so, first one, prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel basically says, uh, God wants you to have everything you want right now. He wants you to have riches and, and big houses and great cars, and he wants all of God's riches to be with you right now in their fullness. And so it says, so prosperity gospel says, if you are suffering, if you're experiencing pain, if your life is not perfect, then that's because you don't have enough faith. You just need to believe harder, try more, then you will have all that God wants you. So the explanation of pain and suffering is it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. And if you want to get out of your current circumstances, believe more. So that's the prosperity gospel, which that fills some of the biggest churches in America and is going um, overseas to parts like Africa and other places with great effectiveness, unfortunately. The second is moralistic therapeutic deism, which it, it's kind of this idea that, that God is, is like our therapist and he just wants you to be good. He just wants to help you. He just wants you to have a nice day. And the way that you do that, it's, it's kind of karma-based. This is where you get the moralistic part. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. And so if you have pain and suffering and trials going on in your life, well, stop doing bad things. Do good things, and then God will help you, and you will have a good life. So again, the problem is you. You just need to do better. Now then. The last one, and this is one that's been emerging for quite some time now and is very, very prominent in our culture. And it's actually because of this last one on April 18th, if you remember, we're going to have our social, our um, faith and justice night here at the church where we're just going to begin talking about what is biblical justice. But this last one is, is critical race theory. And you might say, well, well, that's not a gospel. Well, it It is, in a sense. It's a false gospel. It's it's a world view. It's an explaining of how things are, are, and then it it promises, really, a, a solution to it. And so critical race theory, what it does is it basically breaks everyone up into two groups. And you're either an oppressor or you're the oppressed. You're a victim. And if you are experiencing pain, if you're experiencing suffering, if things aren't going well for you, then the problem is not your sin. 
The problem is not that you're in a sinful world. The problem is nothing to do with your heart. The problem has everything to do with that you are a victim and there are other people out there who are pressing you. And so what critical race theory does is it simply says it blames other people for your circumstances. And ultimately, the gospel of critical race theory is that the oppressed would be given equity, meaning they would have everything that the oppressors have, which, which in turn would, would kind of reverse the roles and make them oppressors. And so that is a, a prominent worldview going out right now in our society. And so the way it handles suffering, it says it's because of someone else. You are a victim. This shouldn't happen to you. But I want you to see that none, none of these worldviews, none of these false gospels offer any help to us. All they do, all they do is point us to either trying harder or pointing our finger at other people. Now let's come and look at just what the true gospel in God's word says. Verse 18, it says, For because he himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Listen, we live in a fallen world, a world characterized by sin, where we all, have sinful, depraved hearts. And so Jesus comes and he saves us and he comes and he lives in the flesh <clears throat> so that he would experience what it's like to be human. He would go through pain and suffering and temptation. But here's the thing. As Jesus went through temptations, as he suffered in all of, in, in his humanity, he never once gave in to it. He stood firm against every temptation. Now, why is that important? Because when you and I, when you and I are tempted, more times than not, at some point, as the weight of that temptation increases on our shoulders and gets heavier and heavier and presses us down further and further, often at some point we give in. We can't take the weight anymore. And so we give in to the temptation. But hear this, Jesus never gave in. Now, why is that so important? Because the weight kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier and pressed him further and further down into the ground. <clears throat> and yet he never gave in. See, you and I, we give in at a certain degree. But because Jesus did, he experienced not only the temptation that you and I experienced, but he experienced temptation at its greatest Wait. Everything that sin and Satan could do, could throw at him, Jesus stood firm against. And we're told that now he, as our faithful and merciful high priest, strengthens you and I so we could stand firm against temptation. You see, what, what the gospel does when we wrestle with sin and suffering, or when we wrestle with pain, and trials, it doesn't just point other places, but rather it points us as we're in a fallen world. And Jesus is here with you to help you, to strengthen you, to give you all the grace you need that you can remain faithful in your obedience to Him. This is what one commentator said. He said, Ever felt abandoned or lonely? Jesus can relate. He is the man of sorrows, rejected and put to death by His own people. Ever felt the grief of losing someone you love? Jesus can relate. He wept at the death of Lazarus. Ever been lied to? Jesus can relate. He was, lied to, he was betrayed by a close friend, falsely accused by the priest, and ridiculed by soldiers. Ever had money problems? Jesus was poor and had nowhere to lay his head. Ever felt misunderstood by a family member? Jesus' own family thought he lost his mind. Ever felt highly stressed? Jesus was so stressed in the Garden of Gethsemane that he sweated drops of blood. You ever been frustrated with others? Both the crowds and Jesus' disciples continually did not understand him. He had to explain things over and over again. Have you ever been tempted with acceptance? You just, you just wanted to belong? 
Jesus was rejected by his own hometown, and they tried to kill him. Ever face the temptation of pride? Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, the people wanted to make him king right then. Ever face the temptation of compromising what you believe so you will not suffer? Remember, Jesus went for 40 days into the wilderness where Satan tempted him. And basically, Satan said, if you bow down to me, I'll give you everything. Basically, Satan was saying, I'll give you the crown without the cross. All you got to do is bow. But what Jesus did against every one of those temptations is stand firm and continue to trust in God. And now, as our faithful and merciful high priest, he stands at the right hand, <clears throat> at the right hand of God, that he would help you and me against every temptation we experience. Do you know that? Remember the context of this letter. The church is suffering through pain, through trials, through persecution. And rather than say, you just need to believe more. Rather than say, you just need to try harder. Rather than say, you need to do better good works. Or rather than just say, you know, it's really other people's fault. What he does is he reminds the church that Jesus has come in the flesh. That Jesus has received the crown of glory. That Jesus has defeated death and Satan. That Jesus grants all believers in him eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and adoption into the family of God. And he promises that he will help you and I to stand firm against whatever trial, against whatever temptation we are going through. So I ask you, what are you going through? What difficulty are you facing? What temptation are, is going, is, are you experiencing? Is something going on at home? A hard marriage? Difficulty parenting? A sibling? A spouse? Financial troubles? Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you lonely? Lustful? Depressed? Jesus knows every temptation. He's experienced all that you and I go through. And we can pray to Him at any moment, asking for His help, asking for His grace, asking that He would strengthen us. And guess what? He doesn't take days off. He doesn't take naps, and He's never distracted. He is perfect. He's infinite in every way. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent, meaning He is everywhere. So that means He can hear you and me and every other believer at the very same time and help us in our trials and our temptations that He would strengthen us. Oh, listen, believer, you are not alone, but your elder brother Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, advocating for you, interceding for you, declaring you justified, and He now will also give you the grace. I just, we just must cry out to Him and depend upon Him. So I ask you, are you trying to go through this in your strength, or are you trusting in our Savior? Are you remembering what He has done for you? That not only would you be saved from your sins, but you'd be strengthened right now. And whatever trial, whatever temptation you are going through, oh, I wonder how much pain and suffering sometimes we go through as Christians simply because we don't turn to Jesus, our King. Here, this is the gospel that Jesus has given to us, that He would save us and strengthen us. You are not alone. Your faithful and merciful high priest is interceding for you right now that you would stand firm. I pray you know that truth. And all of this gospel, it comes by grace. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you've earned it. It has nothing to do with who you are and everything to do with God's grace. That we would worship Him. That we would be full of joy and hope. And that we continue to experience His grace every single day. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you now and we just thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have saved us by your mercy, by your kindness and your goodness. We praise you that you have sent your Son who He came willingly and joyfully to die on the cross for us that we'd be saved, saved from our sins, spared from the second death, 
and that we'd be strengthened in our faith against every trial. Oh, I pray that we, we all have heard and believed the truth that your son Jesus has conquered sin, conquered death, and he stands out at the throne to give us grace right now. Oh, Father, you are good and you are righteous. We praise you in your name, Jesus. Amen.